Hello, everyone, and welcome to Snowflake's predictions for a 2025 virtual event. I'm Ryan Green, Snowflake's news anchor and host of their news network, Data Cloud Now. And I'm delighted to be joining you all for a 2025 predictions program. The most important thing in enterprise technology in 2025 will be, for the third year in a row, advanced artificial intelligence, specifically LLMs and generative AI. But after two years of panic, wonder, and experimentation, 2025 is when businesses start to get real about the actual value AI can bring to their organizations. And that's what today is all about. We've brought together the Snowflake leaders who are tackling these challenges and others as we enter 2025. We have a fantastic program for you today designed to help you create business outcomes that will differentiate you and your businesses for the years to come. The power and promise of AI can sometimes feel overwhelming, but it doesn't have to be. We'll get into conversations that can make sure you are starting with the proper foundation to make the most of your AI tools and the data that fuels them. We've broken the event into four key components and predictions around leadership and AI moves into production, ethics, transparency, and regulation, cybersecurity, and last but certainly not least, our hot takes for the year ahead. Now that we have a roadmap, it's time to hit the gas and attack the road ahead of us. In our first panel, we'll explore predictions around leadership and AI in production. I had the opportunity to sit down with Vivek Raghunathan, SVP of Engineering Support, and Barish Koltekin, Head of AI. Enjoy, and I'll see you on the other side. Barish, ahead of 2024, there was a lot of hype around AI. Now that we're moving from experimentation to action in 2025, what's the actual near-term impact on jobs in everyday life? I'm very excited about what's to come for 2025. Um, we're starting to see um, AI move to production and agentic systems becoming more and more real and, and being used in production systems. When we talk about agentic systems, we talk about uh, kind of autonomous agents, agents uh, where humans are in the loop, taking action, not only just giving you answers, but also doing things. So I believe with agents coming into play, uh, there is going to be even more productivity gains uh, in the workforce. It's an exciting next chapter indeed, Bearish. The report says that everyone working on AI is burned out by how quickly the technology is moving, how something you spent 80 hours on two weeks ago is now outdated by new development. How do leaders keep driving forward at the necessary speed and make sure their teams don't collapse? Vivek would love your perspective. You know, I've been in the industry for 20 years now and more than any other time in, in history, I think, the industry is moving faster than we've ever seen. I'm, you know, with my friends, with my partners, constantly discussing how they feel like the work they're doing, like in the last month is completely obviated by something that shows up. Just last week, we had three models go out, like a bunch of other announcements. The sheer pace of uh, at which we are operating is incredible, uh, right? At the same time, Software and systems take time to deliver real value to customers. You know, it takes time, like months, quarters, sometimes years, to drive that customer value. And so, as as I think of leaders, uh, the advice I give leaders is very much, you know, focus on two lenses. Right? One is what are durable drivers of business value, because at the end of the day, that's the thing customers care for. Right? right? And then the second is make very clear what reasonable technology hypotheses you think would pan out on a two-year basis. So to give you a concrete example, uh, you know, Barish and I might decide that, or might might you know, discuss that the cost of AI inference is going to asymptote to zero, right? It's reducing by 10x every year. So if we kind of draw the arc of technology out, we can say it's going to become vanishingly small. It's going to, it's going to become as cheap as water or like free like the air we, we, we breathe. And then we might ask, what are durable drivers of business value that can benefit from AI inference costs going to zero, right? And we know that problems like deriving insights from your data using AI are, you know, durable problems. They are problems customers have had for like decades and we expect our problems customers will have for decades. And so how can we marry that technology insight we have with what like the drivers of durable business value are? That's what I'd focus leaders on to just prevent their teams from having whiplash. Vivek, great perspective, bearish from your seat. What are you saying? 
I believe that uh, in 2025, like, we need to be very cognizant of not just chasing uh, the hype, chasing the new shiny object, but being very aware of the ROI, um, as Vivek was saying. So I, I believe you know, rather than kind of sending teams off to kind of, you know, chase what's shiny, a lot of teams will start thinking about what is the thing that drives uh, impact? What is the thing that sets them apart from everybody else? So I'm super excited about that. Great perspective. And as we begin to operationalize successful experiments with LLMs and generative AI, we have the fear of moving too slowly and missing out because of the need to ensure security and governance. How should executives and builders work to ensure both? Bearish from your seat. Yes, uh, security and governance are going to be much more at the forefront as LLMs come into the production systems. With that, uh, a lot of the need for understanding what's happening, how the quality is doing, uh, is up front and center. So I believe in 2025, observability will be a core focus. So with observability, what we mean is the ability to kind of see, see into the status, how well a system is doing, and understand and tune that system. Uh, so it, it, coming in, uh, we believe that there is going to be a lot of focus on you know, the quality, the groundedness, the accuracy, the fairness of the LLM systems, AI systems that companies are going to put together. Great perspective in Vivek from your lens. Yeah, I would start off, and I think this is the most important thing like our customers need to pay attention to, is really starting off from a very solid data foundation, right? So picking your AI data cloud is the most important thing you can do. Um, at Snowflake, you know, we start from a really solid data foundation for all of your AI needs, right? Your data is encrypted. Uh, you have authorization and access control, so you can control who has access to your models and your data. We have governance baked into the product we have things like observability and anomaly detection baked into our data product on day zero. Once you do that, I'd layer some of the things Barish said, right? I'd make sure you have your, your evaluation loops dialed in so you can actually measure what value you're driving from your AI products. I'd make sure you have AI observability dialed in so you can see you know, how well this is doing as you put it out into production. Um, I would have things like hallucination detection, hallucination reduction kind of baked in. Right. It's very easy for these LLMs to make up facts and answer questions that they have no business answering. For example, like a couple of years ago, you could have asked, you know, when, which year did Vivek Raghunathan win the Turing Award in? And you know, the LLMs back then would have happily told you I won the Turing Award in 2018 or 2019. And you know, I'm not that smart, <laughs> right? Uh, and so knowing when to abstain is a very important part of the systems that, that we at Snowflake and others are building. And so having systems that reduce that hallucination rate is super critical. And then finally, making sure you can measure fire, fairness, you can measure bias detection, and you can optimize to reduce that to a minimum, super critical. TLDR, make sure you have an amazing data cloud. Make sure that data cloud provides you all the governance, encryption, authorization, and observability. And then make sure that the AI data cloud you build on top of that has things like you know, AI observability, hallucination, protection, bias, fairness, those things. Thank you for both of your collective feedbacks. Now let's move into process. Ideation and experimentation are important, but from the lens of a board of directors or CFO, this can be costly. Do you expect companies to be less forgiving and more action-oriented in demanding results in ROI going forward? Vivek, let's start with you. Yeah, in 2023, I think, or 2000, and 2024 to a large extent, I think the rough flow of the way AI projects got going was roughly this, right? Uh, an investor calls up a board member, says, hey, what's your AI strategy? The board member calls up the CEO, says, hey, what's our AI strategy? You know, CEO turns around to the CIO or the chief data officer or the CTO and says, hey, what's my AI strategy? It's kind of that loop. It's kind of that loop, and then a whole bunch of projects get started, right? right. So it's a little bit, the wild, wild west, it's a little bit, you know, the Cambrian explosion, pick your favorite analogy, um, and people are running a whole bunch of AI projects, right? Uh, and that's roughly the state of the world we are in as we speak, right? It is our belief that in 2025, people will, the CFO will turn around and say, where's the ROI from all these AI projects you'll start in 2023 and 2024? Um, and Make no mistake, there is a ton of amazing insights we have learned through that process of two years of like experimentation, right? So companies have learned what might work and what might not work. But as they start driving towards what is the ROI from my AI projects, our expectation is, you know, the things that always matter will matter, right? 
can I do things at high quality? Can I do things in a safe and secure manner? And can I do these without breaking the bank? Like, can I do this at high ROI, right? So our expectation is, you know, if 2023 and 2024 were the years of exploration, 2025 onwards will start to become the years of exploitation, right? Meaning, when do I put things, what do I put into production? What use cases are driving the high, highest ROI? What use cases are the safest, if you will? What use cases can be done in a cost-efficient manner relative to the, to the value they bring? So that is, I think, in my mind, uh, where we are going to be towards the 2025, 2026 horizon. Thank you for, for that, Vivek. Barish, I want to dive into AI observability. I know that we touched on it a little bit earlier, but it is the practice, as, as you defined, of monitoring AI performance for quality performance drift and more. And it's crucial as AI goes from sandbox to production. And Barish, from your seat, how well do organizations understand this new need for observability in AI? Observability is emerging as a as a new and important space. Uh, of course, a lot of uh, companies are really interested in making sure that their production system is of high quality. But to test how well it's doing, so far it's been what I'd call a vibe-based evaluation. Now we're moving more and more into quantitative, measurable ways to evaluate how well a system is doing. And that is a new uh, area that's emerging. Um, there are a lot of companies that are starting to solve this problem. Uh, but the way uh, our customers, the industry is, is uh, moving is they're evaluating a platform-based approach. How do all of these tools come together to help me bring a high-quality, well-performing application to the market while having me understand all these different elements that you listed, quality and drift and, and so forth. So um, ML observability has been around for a long time. LLM observability is just coming in and emerging as an important area. It's the new frontier, bearish. And this further supports the notion of the importance of having a strong data strategy as the underlying foundation for AI innovation. How ready are most companies' data estates to support them in the race to generative AI value? And how does unstructured data fit into this equation, bearish? So we've recently done a survey uh, with, uh, with MIT uh, that essentially says uh, about a little over 20% of uh, respondents to the survey say they are very ready uh, for AI. AI feeds on data, so it's really important to have a solid data foundation where bringing all your data assets together will help you build capable, high-performing um, AI systems. Uh, and to do that, you need to, uh, you, you need to be ready from a uh, platform perspective. Great to hear, Bearish. In keeping with this lines of questions, Vivek, why is it fundamental to have that top-down data approach when it comes to AI integration? Look, when I talk to customers, there are you know two kinds of customers who have very successful AI strategies, right? One, you know, you have someone at the top, maybe the CEO, maybe the CTO, who has a very strong vision for what transformation looks like in their organization and how they're going to use AI, right? And the second is, you know more of the let a you know a thousand flowers bloom approach right. where the CEO or the CTO have have created this innovation center or like have let various have empowered their various organizational leaders to just use generative AI to improve their own systems and their own organizations in a little bit of a laissez-faire fashion right uh, but regardless of which approach you take if you want to get your use cases and your applications into production you need a top-down data strategy, right? That is the one thing you cannot wing. You know, things like, is my data secure? Things like, do the right people have access to my data and my models, right? Things like the thing Barish spoke about, like, do you have the ability to monitor how these things are doing and have anomaly detection, right? These things are too critical for us to be able to, you know, just wing. And so, at some level, converting these prototypes, if you will, converting these uh, you know, demos or these POCs, if you will, into real production use cases. If you want to do that, there's only one game in town. It's a top-down data strategy where you mandate what your requirements for an AI data cloud are. And you start from there and you make sure you have those because that's the only way you're taking these POCs into live production use cases. Vivek, great perspective. Thank you for that. Gentlemen, I realize we've covered quite a lot here today. From your collective seats over the near term, what will be the best use of AI at the enterprise level? Barish, let's start with you. 
We're seeing a lot of great examples that span the gamut. A lot of the focus uh, today is on improving the productivity. We see uh, companies bring um, capabilities to their research teams so that their research teams can be a lot more productive by making all of that research searchable, accessible through AI systems. All the way to healthcare, we're seeing uh, healthcare providers making all the medical information accessible so that medical questions can be answered in real time. There are a lot of great examples of AI in all sectors, you know, financial industry, um, you know, media industry, and so forth, like ad systems being a lot more accurate and, uh, and, and targeted, uh, all the way to manufacturing uh, being, uh, in, uh, in bringing uh, productivity gains to manufacturing and, and reducing errors. Um, so AI is touching everywhere, uh, all industries. Great to hear, Vivek, from your seat. Yeah, I want to take a quick tour down memory lane. Right? Love that. It's 1983, most of your listeners aren't born. Um, they, there's the PC, and people are asking the same question, like what is the killer application for the PC? You know, there's a small company, VisiCalc, and they produce this spreadsheet, and then like somebody else produces a better spreadsheet, and next thing you know, you know, the spreadsheet is the killer app for the PC. Um, and one could argue, you know, that the killer app for the spreadsheet was a use case like accounting or finance, because you know, those departments live in Excel or Google Sheets or whatever, what have you. But the spreadsheet is far beyond like those use cases, right? All of us use spreadsheets, all of us use them for all kinds of things. Maybe we use them for personal finance, maybe we use them to track projects, maybe we use them to track tasks. People have discovered an infinite number of use cases for the spreadsheet. It's fundamental. It's fundamental. And what I would argue by analogy is you fast forward 30 years to now, um, and I would argue the killer app of the LLM, the large language model, is the LLM, the large language model, right? Yes, there will be some, you know, incredibly high value use cases like the ones Barish referred to, like places where you can do research or you can like add incredible amounts of value in healthcare. Uh, but there'll be a long, long tail of use cases where you know just people like you and me will will say, I can use an LLM to take some stuff that I would not need an expert to do for me and now I'm gonna just do like 90% of it myself. Right? And so I'm gonna hobbyist patch together like a use case that just solves my problem for me, right? We see sales operations teams sometimes come to us and they've gone and analyzed all of their, you know, the use cases their customers have and clustered them in ways and said, hey, we have these gaps in these, uh, in these use cases. And historically, that might have taken a 10% data science team to do for them. Right? And now you have like, you know, one salesperson sitting together with an LLM and, and their data and just transforming it in ways that are useful to them, right? So to me, in my mind, that long tail of use cases, that democratizing nature of LLMs, that ability for an LLM to take someone who's never written software and then let them write code, or taking someone who's never analyzed data and let them analyze and chart data. You know, that ability for LLMs to take what 100 people can do and now suddenly allow a million people to do it, to me, that is the killer empowering feature of like LLMs. So in other words, I expect the, you know, the killer app of the LLM to be the LLM, just like the spreadsheet. Well, gentlemen, it's safe to say it's all going to happen in 2025. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to see you a little bit later on in the program, but thank you so much for kicking us off here with Predictions 2025. Thank you. Thank you. And for the audience watching, let's continue to explore how Snowflake is integrating this technology internally. We'll see you on the other side.